Today's guest is um, Ernie Tamminga, and uh, I want John Cobb to say a word, um, he, uh, not about Ernie, but about uh, Tehard de Chardin and Whitehead. We started all this, John, when we saw that you'd written an article uh, not so long ago about uh, Whitehead and Tehard, and we don't need that article, but we would like your uh, welcome to the theme. Well, I'll, I'll just say that I am delighted that we are dealing with this topic. I think we should have been inviting somebody from specifically from the Teilhard community. Of course, there have been people here who have known Teilhard well and have also referred to him. Uh, I owe a great deal to Teilhard very personally. So you may be interested in that. There was a time when he was very influential in official circles, as well as unofficial circles in the Roman Catholic Church. And after a conference, one of the major conferences at which there'd been a lot of Teilhard, I got for about uh, 10 years, half of my graduate students were Catholics. Because if you get interested in Teilhard as a philosopher and really press, you're likely to be interested in Whitehead also. Well, that has all changed, the door slammed shut, but I'm very grateful for the, for, for the real intellectual con connections that, have, that made that happen. Thank you. Ernie, you'll have to correct me if I don't pronounce your name right. Ernie Taminga, is that correct? We've, uh, you're, you're saying it right, Ronald, and we say it wrong. Um, oh, okay. <laughs> we say Taminga. That, that's the, how oh, most people Taminga. pronounce it. I, it. The way you pronounce it is really correct. It's a Dutch name, and the emphasis on the first syllable, as you're doing, is the right way to say it. Well, I'm going to just try plain old Ernie right now. you got so many <laughs> friends in the room. Uh, you've been reflecting on Tehard's vision for over 50 years. You earned your PhD at the University of California, Santa Barbara. And for five years, you were a member of uh, Ramon Panikar's um, uh, graduate seminar in cross-cultural religious anthropology. Uh, you actually were working with uh, one of our groups that was following uh, that work, and uh, we appreciate your participation. Um, your dissertation was an analysis and a critique of uh, Tehard's notion of a privileged axis of evolution. You're a trained spiritual director. For 20 years, you were a member of the board and the teaching faculty of Still Point, the Center for Christian Spirituality. And a long time ago, you were a board member of the Phenomenon of Man Project, a nonprofit that offered uh, retreats and presentations centered on the vision of Tehard de Chardin. Uh, you describe yourself as a planet empath. I think you're welcome here then. Uh, you and your wife have between, them, between you uh, 12 grandchildren, and that intensifies your sense of urgency about what you're doing to our beloved planet. Ernie, thank you for being with us this morning. We look forward to what you have to share with us. Thank you very much. Um, John Cobb a moment ago referred to the, the intellectual adventure of, of being familiar with Teilhard and Whitehead. Uh, what I'm going to do here is kind of an intellectual and emotional adventure. Uh, in preparing for this, I veered between the existential emotional urgency of the crisis of our planet, as voiced in John Cobb's letter to um, <clears throat> President Biden and Xi Jinping, veering between that on the one hand and on the other the intellectual delight of trying to grasp together uh, the works of Teilhard and Whitehead. So what I'm going to present is a It'll reflect the duality of that intention, both emotional and intellectual. I will be going into Teilhard in much more depth in a, a learning circle that's coming up in November. And I'll ref in that circle, I will also reflect some on my current critiques of Teilhard's thought. 
Um, I really appreciate the inspirational power especially, and I have a lot of problems these days with the anthropomorphism of Teilhard, but I'm, I'm not going to go into that here today. I've been contemplating the work of Teilhard for over 50 years, and I'm a relative newcomer to Whitehead, although I've been now for five years or so a member of a living room seminar in the home of David Ray Griffin and my former spiritual director, Anne Jacqua, David's wife. I can't claim to be, be able to speak fluent Whiteheadian, but with the help of John Cobb's Whitehead Words book and a few other resources, um, I think maybe I can speak at least conversational Whiteheadian at this point. I must admit that this project has been somewhat excruciating, partially thanks to Whitehead's exquisitely specialized vocabulary. Um, but we're going to have a go at it. The experience of pondering Whitehead and Teilhard together has been an instance of what my main life teacher, Ramon Panikar, called an intra-religious dialogue. Not inter-religious, but intra-religious. I'm metaphorically referring here to Teilhard and Whitehead as religions. They're not really religions, but they fit the model that I'm trying to talk about as an intra-religious dialogue. In an intra-religious dialogue, it's the experience of having two or more different religions encounter one another in the mind and the depths of one's own consciousness, in a way, encountering each other in a way that makes it impossible to reject either one, also impossible to reduce one to the other. My graduate study at UC Santa Barbara with Panikar was in cross-cultural religious studies, and a fairly typical approach to cross-cultural religious studies, especially in secular universities, is to take two or more religions and hold them both at arm's length and say things about them. Uh, Ramon Panikar's approach to cross-cultural religious studies was to look at issues in the real world through the eyes of two or more religions. There may be discoverable resonances between Teilhard and Whitehead, but they're not the same, and they don't even often ask the same questions. So rather than using Teilhard as a lens for interpreting Whitehead or the other way around, I'm going to go confessional, as John Cobb said in his little essay on Whitehead and Teilhard. I'll try to look through their eyes at some of the issues in the real world, and especially my own personal deepest issues. For my format here, I'm going to honor the approach that was often used by Panikar in his presentations, a mixture of intellectual reflections, personal confession, and poetry. The teleology of my presentation will lead to, I'm going to see if I can share my screen here. Um, if this takes a moment, please forgive. Do you see a blue screen? Well, I can't see you at the moment. Yes, we're seeing it just fine. Okay, I need to change my other screen so I can see something else I need to see. I'll be right back. Hide, present, there we are. Okay. So the teleology of my presentation will lead us, hopefully together, to this. You are always complete, and you're never finished. I think that both Teilhard and Whitehead would agree with this, each in his own way. And this, the closing inv invitation at the end of my presentation will be this. Embrace the yearning. 
So let's begin. The real world issue that I want to engage through and with Teilhard and Whitehead is this. This is our home and in Greta Thunberg's statement, her famous statement, she said, our house is on fire. This is our home. A house is on fire. A moment ago, it was mentioned that I call myself a planet empath. I deeply feel the state of our planet in my mind, my heart, my body. One of my favorite things that anybody ever said about me was I overheard my wife saying to a friend of ours about 20 years ago, if it has a beating heart, Ernie loves it. <laughs> she also said to a different friend around the same time, Ernie can't even talk about the planet without crying. I treasure both of those statements because they're both true. It doesn't take too much paying attention today to be convinced of this. I think that both Teardians and Whiteheadians today would likely agree with this statement, even if from different perspectives. End game doesn't have to mean the end. It might be, and it might not be. We are in a liminal period between no and yes. The planet's not going to end, but whether we get to be part of her continuing evolution is an open question. Some folks think the planet would be better off if we all disappeared. Perhaps so. But if humanity were to go extinct, I think it would be a damn shame. And Earth would have to give birth to a new self-aware species. I'm absolutely convinced of this. Earth wants to be self-aware. I don't just mean self-aware as in Gaia, a, a self-regulating system. I do mean that, but I mean more. I mean self-aware in at least the same way that humans are self-aware. There's a particular uniqueness to the way that we are self-aware. To know and to know that one knows, to use a phrase that's become maybe too familiar. Earth wants to be self-aware. I'm convinced that the yearning toward awakening that's felt by at least millions of people is a yearning that belongs to Earth herself. Our own urgent passion for awakening is the passion of Earth herself. Teilhard says that the process of evolution, or rather the process, yes, the process of evolution, evolution of consciousness he's referring to, the process of evolution is the process of Earth awakening. We humans are, says Teilhard, evolution become conscious of itself. Whiteheadians might or might not agree with that, although if they do, they'd probably say it in different words. I'm going to continue with the, by switching to the emotional part for a moment, as if I haven't already been. This is a little poem. Last night I dreamed a sunrise, rising on an empty world, green, green, green. I saw it with my own eyes, lighting up an empty world, green, green, green. Where did we all go? Why disappear so soon? I'll never really know. Good night, sun. Good night, moon. The skies belong to you now, up above a resting world, green, green, green. Nothing's false or true now. A stirring world still dreams of us, green, green, green. Tonight I dreamed a longing for what we might have been, a passionate belonging of blessings intertwining, green, green, 
Green. Farewell, my love, beloved. A kiss, goodbye, and then, will you dream of us, reborning, if there ever comes a morning when we can try again? Green, green, green. A conceptual tool that I find, I'm switching to intellectual, a conceptual tool that I find very useful is the Venn diagram, which allows one to propose areas of possible resonance between two viewpoints while recognizing their differences. Like that. The first comparison is in the scope of inquiry. This illustration might possibly overstate the difference a bit, but I think in, in this in the area of scope, there, there's not a lot of overlap inherently. Taird is focused on the very large scale in terms of both space and time. He does talk about subatomic particles a bit, but his focus is really or ultimately the infinite. Whitehead, on the other hand, presents an analysis of process and reality that is exquisitely atomistic, even though the units being pondered can be anything from subatomic quantum fields on up to any definition of actual occasions. In light of that difference, let's have a joke, a geek joke. So Alfred North Whitehead and Thierry de Chardin walk into a bar. The, bar. the bartender approaches and says, what's up? Whitehead takes the question to mean, what's happening? And his response might look like this, a swarm of actual occasions, a swarm of many, many, many actual occasions, which might eventuate in a concrescence, to use his word, um, a move forward. Teilhard, on the other hand, might take the question to mean, what's up? What is up? And his answer might look like this. Up is the direction, the inherent direction of evolution, with humanity as its current crown of self-awareness, with further evolution still up ahead. A focus on change is common to both Teard and Whitehead. Broadly, broadly speaking, I would say that Teard's focus on change is in terms of the toward what and toward where is change directed, and also the why of change. In contrast, at least to my understanding, Whitehead's emphasis is mainly on the, the how, and what are the mechanisms and the processes of change. They overlap, though, in both being concerned with change. The key word about change for Teilhard is convergence. Uh, one of his famous quotes is, all that rises must converge. And th there's a book, a novel, um, that carried that name. And the author got that phrase from Teilhard, all that rises must converge. The key word for Whitehead is concrescence. The many become one and are increased by one. Teilhard's emphasis is strictly on the one in what he calls an evolutionary monism. For Whitehead, reality is one in the sense that everything affects everything else, but the, the focus is on the how, at least as I read it, on the how everything affects 
everything else, a really microscopic look at how everything affects everything else. When I enter into an intra-religious dialogue between Teilhard and Whitehead, I find them both to be self-evidently true. And that's a reflection of how my own mind works. Everything reminds me of everything else. My mind has always worked that way. Sometimes that's almost oppressive, and sometimes it's exhilarating. Everything reminds me of everything else. I recently wrote myself a little note that says, Your thoughts rise up like a murmuration of starlings. Let them fly. Do not be daunted by the overwhelming multiplicity, but also behold the shape as it undulates and flows within itself. Speaking very broadly again, I would venture that Whitehead's focus is on the individual birds, although concrescence does happen. Focus on the individual birds and the way they interact, whereas Teilhard's focus would be on the entire flock and on the, the patterning and the shape of the emergence of the flock. So how do things change? For Teilhard, it's directed chance. And I, I read emergence as another area where Teilhard and Whitehead overlap. But the definition or the understanding of emergence is somewhat different. In Teilhard, <coughs> the directionality is completely explicit. Evolution and change is directed chance, whereas Whitehead talks about the call forward toward greater enjoyment, but he does not, as Teilhard does, um, define what forward means or toward what. Uh, Teilhard explicitly does define that. That brings us to the topic of God, if we're going to talk about directed chance. Another area of both overlap and difference. For Teilhard, God is present below at the beginning, impelling the process of evolution forward. Teilhard's God is also already fully present as what he calls Omega, already fully complete above and drawing us forward. Without Omega being already fully complete, Teilhard maintains, the evolutionary impulse would fade away. For Whitehead, God has primordial nature and a subsequent nature, and here I enter toward the limits of my understanding of Whitehead so far, but I'll give it a try. The primordial nature is, and th this is a quote from Whitehead, the primordial nature of God is that actual entity from which each temporal concrescence receives that initial aim from which its self-causation starts. That's quite a definition. That definition feels to me at least relatable to Teilhard's Alpha, even though Whitehead's God is not defined in a temporal context as Teilhard's is. Whitehead's subsequent nature of God can be said to undergo change. Not as God as an entity, but the nature of God undergoes change in the subsequent nature of God, as God prehends every actual occasion. That's about all I can say with any confidence about Whitehead's God. Here I will insert a quote from Teilhard de Chardin, which I think might resonate enough with both Teard and Whitehead to justify keeping God in that overlapping part of this diagram. Here's a quote from Teard. The God from whom our century is waiting must be as vast and mysterious as the cosmos, as immediate and all-embracing as life, as linked in some way to our effort as humanity. Again, this is my main lens. We are in the end game of the current phase of planetary evolution. 
what or who will call us forward from here? Where will we find the inspiration to move forward? In John Cobb's recent sermon on discipleship that he presented on Zoom on September 21, he notes that the distinctive form of Christian spirituality is that God calls us forward. God wants us to be more alive. This affirmation is grounded in Christian spirituality rather than arising directly from process itself. That's not a criticism, it's an observation. In his essay on process eschatology, David Ray Griffin characterizes his Salvation Three, as he calls it, as grounded in the vision of a world at peace with a global bill of rights and a democratized civilization that could end the climate crisis and imperialism. That would be, he affirms briefly, an advance in evolution. Again, that vision, compelling as it is, um, is couched in an appeal to Christianity in, in Griffin's work as distinct from rising explicitly from within process itself. Again, that's not a criticism, it's an observation. In his essay on Teilhard and Whitehead, John Cobb says this, quote, Whitehead has inspired some of us to write Whiteheadian theology. Thus far, none of us has matched the achievement of Teilhard with respect to evocative power. Perhaps the time will come when the Whiteheadian understanding of reality can be presented with the emotional and spiritual effectiveness that Teilhard achieved in presenting his own, still quoting. Meanwhile, Whiteheadians can rejoice that in many of the most important ways, the impact of Teilhard's writings overlap the hoped-for impact of the Whiteheadian vision." Unquote. That was John Cobb. This doesn't mean that Whitehead's own work is incapable of stirring us in its own way. In his little book on process relational philosophy, uh, C. Robert Messel is led to explain, holy cow, wow, that's in his little book. His excitement arises not from a sweeping view of the cosmos, as in Teilhard. The excitement for Messel arises rather in the eye and mind opening view of the dynamics that are alive in each moment, each microsecond of life, the thrill of really feeling how that works. Once, he's, once you catch the process virus, as I think both Messel and Cobb say, once you catch the process virus, you never see, the, never see things the same way again. So Teilhard's explicitly inspirational. We are, he says, responsible to and one with an evolutionary all. Here's the, the quote about God again from Teilhard. The, the God for whom our century is waiting that was his century, 20th. Ours is still waiting. The God from, for whom our century is waiting must be as vast and mysterious as the cosmos, as immediate and all-embracing as life, as linked in some way to our effort as humanity. Already in the 1980s, Ramon Panacar, my main teacher, wrote, what we must discover is the awareness that we not only belong to the earth, but that we and the earth are together. My being, says Panakar, does not end at the tips of my fingernails. I am also in the rivers I swim, the water I drink, the soil I tread, tread upon, the air that I breathe, the mountains I climb, the streets I walk, and of course, the people I dwell among. Are we finally groping toward an awakened consciousness of God? In 1948, the British physicist Fred Hoyle wrote that once a photograph of the earth taken from the outside is available, a new idea as powerful as any in history will be let loose. He said that in 1948. 
In 1968, on Christmas Eve, that photograph was taken. Earth presented herself to humanity in the mode of effective immediacy. Millions or billions of people experienced the concrescence of what should have been a transformational active, actual occasion. Perhaps it, perhaps it was transformational. It was for many. Perhaps it was the beginning of a new phase of planetary evolution. But phases of evolution emerge at their own pace, and Earth has not yet fully become conscious of herself. In the 1960s, we sang, this is the dawning of the age of Aquarius. Personally, I believe it was. I don't know astrology, but I believe that was the dawning of a new age in the sense that a major change of planetary consciousness was getting underway. Our mistake at the time was to imagine that a change of age could happen overnight. The dawning is still underway, even as we may also be tipping toward too late. That's a chilling phrase that was used by Catherine Keller in a recent Cobb Institute activity. That phrase kind of haunts me, tipping toward too late. Thanks a lot, Catherine Keller. Vast numbers of us still feel the stirrings, stirrings of an awakening planet. The possibility of an awakening planet is something I'll try to cont contemplate in depth in the Teilhard study circle that's coming up. Not right now. Both Teilhard and Whitehead died well before 1968, so neither of them saw this photograph. I suspect they would have both have had said something wonderful about this moment, but we'll never know for sure. But in light of this moment, I do believe that Teilhard's cosmic vision and Whitehead's what I might call quantum sight are both vital to our understanding. And I believe that the stirrings of awakening, the yearnings for transformation into awareness belongs to Earth herself. And our own yearnings are a prayer and maybe even a sacrament, a sacrament of communion. Fall in love with the future and the present will remember how to breathe. I'll offer another poem at this point, getting close to the end. This is a poem for the love of the future. It's an optimistic poem in that it's dedicated to my daughter, Kimberly, and to generations yet to come. Footprints in the Sand. I hope we come into your mind maybe once or twice a day. I hope you hold the memory for a while, and maybe you'll recall little things we used to say, and I'm hoping that the memory makes you smile. I hope your heart is full of peace, because I know it's full of grace. So I tell you, don't let anyone pretend that your loving heart is not a blessed, sacred place, or that love like this can ever have an end. May our footprints in the sand help you find a place to stand. May you come to know the love that we have known. May all we've loved so much hold the memory of our touch. And may you hear us calling, welcome home. And finally, one more poem, When Tomorrow Comes Round Again. I believe you'll be singing the songs that you sang. I can't remember back when. I think you'll be dancing the steps that you taught me when tomorrow comes round again. I believe you'll be crying so hard that you're laughing and you'll open your eyes and then you'll see for the first time the world you believed in when tomorrow comes round again. So take my hands and hold them for one sweet moment in time, and we'll be the pulse 
of all of creation when our hearts are beating in rhyme. I can't wait to see the smile on your face when there is no need to pretend that your heart wasn't breaking all that time you were waiting for tomorrow to come round again. So take my hands and hold them for one sweet moment in time and we'll be the pulse of all of creation when our hearts are beating in rhyme.